Uh, thanks for coming. I realize uh, for those of you who are submitting papers to stock, I'm one of the people keeping you from working on your stock submissions. So thanks for coming. Uh, and for the, those of you who are waiting for lunch, I'm also the, one of the people keeping you from lunch. So again, thanks for coming. Um, so there are a bunch of there's a bunch of jargon in this title. Hopefully, I'll uh, explain what the jargon means. Um, this is joint work with. Uh, Kiran Chiragur and Aaron Sitford. Aaron is a colleague in MSNE, and Kiran is a student who's jointly advised by Aaron and me at Stanford. Okay, so let me start with a simple problem. Uh, in stock is about a simple problem. I want to, if anything, I want to just explain what this problem is. Um, so the setting is that we have some unknown distribution over a domain, uh, and we have access to this unknown distribution via samples, we'd like to estimate some property of this distribution. Okay. So we have access to n IID samples from this distribution and based on this we'd like to say something about some property of this distribution. Okay, so very simple question, uh, somewhat broad, so we're going to try to get a little more specific. We'll think about symmetric properties, properties that are don't depend on the actual identities of the objects that we see in our sample. Uh, for example, if it was a urn of colored balls, and uh, I care about some property that depends on the distribution, but not about how many red balls there are, and how many blue balls there are, and so on and so forth. Uh, it doesn't matter if all of the labels who permeated the value, the property would be the same. So for example, the entropy is, is such a property, uh, the support size is such a property, and so on. So we're interested in properties that don't actually depend on the actual labels, they just depend on the histogram of the distribution. Okay, so, uh, and basically we're gonna ask this question of how well we can estimate this property based on a sample, all right? So, so now let me tell you about the other notion, which is in the title, which is this notion of profile maximum likelihood. Okay. Um, so again, let's think about a simple setting. We have a domain of size three. Um, so a, elements A, B, and C. Uh, and say we pick three IID samples. Uh, and let's say we get A first, then we get B next, then we get A. So the sequence of samples is A, B, A. Now, we'll say that the profile of the sample is just a vector of frequencies, okay? And just for convenience, I'll sort this vector of frequencies so the highest numbers appear first. So I'll say the profile of this sequence ABA is 2 comma 1, okay? And, you know, this, this term, uh, this concept is called by different names. Sometimes it's called the pattern, sometimes it's called the histogram. We're going to call it the profile, okay? All right, so um, let's see, suppose we had, suppose the underlying distribution was P, then we can say, what's the probability that I see the actual sequence A, B, A? What's the probability that the first element was A, the next element was B, the next element was A, okay? And this probability will be <coughs> P A squared times P B, right? Okay, you could also ask another question. We could say, um, what's the probability of seeing a sequence whose profile was 2 comma 1, right? Now, if you wanted to think about what's the probability of seeing a sequence whose profile was 2 comma 1, there are a few different ways you might see this. You might see two A's and a B, you might see two B's and a C, you might see two A's and a C, and so on. So there's six different possibilities, and then for each of them, there are three ways in which those elements could be permuted. Okay, so we've got to add up the probabilities of each of these possibilities and that gives us the probability of seeing a sequence whose profile is 2 comma 1. Alright, so we'll think of this as the probability of the profile. Okay, so the two things that we, two concepts that we learned here. One was, what's the probability of seeing a particular sequence? And then the second one was, what's the probability of seeing a particular profile? So the order doesn't count in which you observe these things, right? The order doesn't count, yeah. Right. Okay. 
we sort of explicitly accounting for that here. All right, good. Uh, so now let me talk about two notions of maximum likelihood. One that you're very familiar with and another one which I want to tell you about, okay? So given a sequence, let's look at the profile of the sequence. Um, the usual notion of maximum likelihood is what I call the sequence maximum likelihood. What's the probability P that would maximize the probability of having seen this particular sequence of elements? Okay. So this is the sequence maximum likelihood problem. Okay. So you have access to a bunch of samples, look at the samples and you say, what's the underlying distribution that would maximize the probability of seeing this particular sequence? Okay. What do you think it is? It's just the empirical distribution, right? So it's just the distribution that you see over this sample. Right? So it's the counts divided by the length of it. Okay. Um, let's ask a different question. What's the probability distribution that maximizes the probability of seeing something of this particular profile? Okay. So this I'm going to call the profile maximum likelihood. All right. So what's the probability distribution which maximizes the probability of seeing a sequence that has exactly the profile that we saw? All right. Slightly different, somewhat unintuitive, it's not quite clear what this is doing. So let's, let's take some examples. Okay. So we had our earlier example where we had a sequence ABA, the profile was 2,1. And we said, we already did this, right? The sequence maximum likelihood was 2 third, 1 third. Okay? What's the profile maximum likelihood? Any ideas? Uniform? Turns out that it's actually uniform over two elements. Okay? So it turns out that the profile maximum likelihood is actually the uniform distribution over two elements. Right? It's, um, it's, a, it's a calculation. You can sit down and try to do it yourself. Uh, so notice I'm, I'm not telling you that my universe has two elements. If you look over all possible sets of distributions, you'll find that the one that maximizes the profile maximum likelihood is in fact the uniform distribution over two elements. Okay. Right, here's another one. What if we had um, profile 2, 1, 1? So we saw two of one element, one of another element, one of another element. Okay. So again, the sequence maximum likelihood we know, it's the empirical <coughs> distribution. What happens to the profile maximum likelihood? Uh, it's still uniform. It's still uniform? Okay, so it's not always uniform. In this case, it is. <laughs> okay. So just, I should have given you an example where it's not uniform, but it's not always uniform, but in this case it is uniform. It's actually uniform over five elements. Okay, so it turns out that the profile maximum likelihood is actually uniform over five elements, which is weird, somewhat strange, but it shows this interesting property that this concept of profile maximum likelihood seems to automatically incorporate this feature that, uh, you know, there are likely elements of your distribution that you haven't seen in your sample. Okay, so this is a somewhat, this is a concept that people do try to wrap their heads around, try to figure out how to handle this. In some sense, this profile maximum likelihood seems to incorporate this in a, in a nice way. Because it's predicting that even though you've seen a sample of four elements, you've only seen three distinct elements, you know, there could be uh, elements in your distribution that you haven't seen. So we're going to think about this, this notion of profile maximum. The reason I spent so much time on this slide is just to make sure that we're all comfortable with this idea of profile maximum likelihood. Okay, it's a very simple, intuitive, I think very appealing concept. Okay? So just to make sure, I, I think I missed something. Like the alphabet is not given to you beforehand? Let's say I don't tell you what is the size of the alphabet. I mean, you could also think about situations where I know something about the size of the alphabet. So you, you might apply this, for example, in settings where you're trying to estimate the support size. Yeah, so you have a sample, and you're trying to estimate the support size. You don't know a priori what the support size is. In the number of species problem? Yeah, exactly. 
So in this later example, if I already like, if I tell you that the size of the alphabet is three, what would be the profile maximum like? Because I only observed A, B, C, and A, so it's three. Yeah. Uh, good question. So I didn't I haven't done that calculation. Maybe I, I'm guessing it's uniform over three. If that's if you do that, but I'm not sure. Yeah. So <clears throat> intuitively, it feels like things that are symmetric uh, under permutations of the labels, <coughs> they would probably always lead to uniform likelihood because. Uh, what do you mean with things that are uniform? So profile is is symmetric. Like if you re renamed yeah. uh, it, re renamed uh -huh. A, B, and C, then the profile would still be the same, right? Well, let's say this. Suppose I drew a sample of 100, and 99 of them happen to be one element, and one happened to be some other element. The uniform distribution on two elements is not going to be your profile maximum likelihood. Okay. So it stops at a point. I mean, these simple examples are uh, they're pretty small numbers. So uh, you can you can actually get the wrong conclusion. You can get the wrong intuition from these simple examples. So it, it does matter how large these numbers are. In fact, in your profile, if you have some very large numbers, um, you're not going to put uniform distribution. Okay. So yeah, it's, it's not entirely obvious what these values ought to be. And there's, it's, there's something very counterintuitive about what this profile maximum likelihood gives you. OK, so you know, what is, how do you compute this profile maximum likelihood? So first of all, let's ask the following question. Suppose you have a distribution P. How do you compute the probability of seeing this particular profile if your underlying distribution was P? Okay. So you can do this. It's, a, it's not very hard. You can write down an expression. And one way to write down an expression is to say that this underlying probability is proportional to the permanent of a certain matrix. Okay. So one way to do this would be to say, uh, so there's going to be a, a combinatorial term, OK? And then there's going to be a permanent. The, the permanent is going to be the following. If you have probabilities pi for elements, you have frequencies fj in your sample, then this, the ijth entry of this permanent is going to, of this matrix is going to be pi to the power of <coughs> fj, OK? And you're going to have, so if you try to figure out what, what this probability is going to be, there's going to be a combinatorial term. And then you're going to want to sum up over all terms of this permanent. It's not very hard to see. Um, so the fact that this is a permanent seems to suggest, well, OK, this particular way of formulating the problem leads to a permanent, which seems to suggest this may be a difficult thing to do. We don't know for sure. Um, we can compute the permanent to with an arbitrary accuracy via Jerome Sinclair Vazirani, for example. But we're asking the question not for a given probability. We're saying, what's the probability that would maximize this expression? So it has the feeling of a hard problem, okay? although I don't have proof of this. All right. Um, there are a few different heuristic algorithms that have been proposed for this problem. Um, actually, the, the original paper that proposed this notion of profile maximum likelihood um, this was joint work uh, by Elon Orlitsky and his collaborators. And he and his collaborators have uh, developed this notion over a sequence of papers. This was the paper where they introduced the idea. Um, so they, said, they suggested an expectation maximization heuristic to do this. Um, there are a few other approaches that have been used. There's one, you know, there's, there's a lot of theory about approximating permanence, and there's something called the Pethy free energy approximation of a permanent. That's been used to try to approximate this. And then very recently, there was an interesting dynamic programming heuristic of uh, public in Jiao and Weissman that again tries to approximate this profile maximum life year. Okay? None of these actually have any guarantees, but people try to experiment with these and see how well they perform in, for data sets of interest. All right. OK. So let me say a little bit about why we might be interested in this Profile maximum. Like, you know, I think it's a very simple, intuitive concept. So I think it's a natural object of study. But there's another reason why you might want to be in, you might be interested in this idea, in this profile maximum likelihood. Okay. So let me talk a little bit about 
estimating symmetric properties. Okay. So remember, uh, you know, a symmetric property is one that's invariant to permutations of the labels. Okay. Now the profile of the sample is actually a sufficient statistic for symmetric properties. Right. So if you're if you're interested in a symmetric property, you don't actually care about the labels. You might as well throw them away. So again, let's look at this problem of trying to estimate a symmetric property given access to n samples. There's a bunch of literature on this. A bunch of different properties have been studied. For example, support, something called support coverage, entropy, distance from uniformity. And for each of these, now by now we know, uh, you know, very good bounds matching upper and lower bounds in many cases. But what's the optimum number of samples that you need? Okay. And in many of these cases, there are customized estimators for each of these. So, you know, there's an estimator that works for one, another estimator that works for the other one, and so on and so forth. One question you could ask is, is there a universal approach? Is there a way by which you could use one method and actually design estimators for all of these different properties? And interestingly, uh, in a recent paper, um, they showed that this is indeed the case. So profile maximum likelihood indeed can serve as a universal approximator, a universal estimator for symmetric property. Okay, so what they're saying is consider the, the, the following approach. Take your sample, compute the profile maximum likelihood distribution, compute your property of interest on this profile maximum likelihood distribution, and output that as your estimator. And this is going to be competitive with respect to the best estimator for symmetric properties under some technical conditions, which I'm not going to bother defining precisely here. But for a wide class of uh, symmetric properties, this approach is going to give you nearly optimum estimate. Okay, so that's attractive. That's, that's one good reason why we might care about doing this. Yeah? The epsilon approximation is measure how? Oh, see, uh, what do I mean by that? That, that means that I get my uh, estimate to within 1 plus minus epsilon. So add it in. No, multiply it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So does that include all the examples in the previous slide? Yeah, the examples were designed, uh, were chosen because they actually uh, fit this theorem. So you get uh, optimal sample complexity. Yes, yeah, so there's a little bit of caveat. I mean, you're losing constant factor. Okay. You lose what? Uh, you, I think this, theor this theorem loses constant factor. So if there was an optimum estimator that uses n samples, this one will use order of n samples. I see. Okay. So we're losing a little bit. But it's one approach that works for all of these methods. Okay. There is a, there is a technical condition that they, this, this theorem is not saying that this works for any symmetric property. It works for symmetric properties where the optimum estimators have a certain Lipschitz uh, property, okay. but, which is something that I'm not I'm not talking about here. I'm hiding under the carpet. But you should go look at this uh, this paper if you want to see more about this. For me, this this is more a motivation for why this profile maximum likelihood question is an interesting one. So uh, uh, there's also a lit, uh, results in the literature saying that uh, if you can uh, optimally estimate it, uh, estimate the sorted distribution, you can also plug in and get optimal estimate. Is it is this uh, more or the same thing? Uh, I know there's such a such a result. This is not necessarily saying the same thing. This is saying specifically about this profile maximum likelihood. There's something about the form of this objective function that lends itself to this kind of theorem. Okay, so I, I don't think the two theorems are the same. So uh, does it, for example, does it imply you also get an optimal uh, estimator for the sorted distribution? Does it imply that? Um, or maybe the other way around. Does the sorted distribution give you? It give you an op you know, I'm not sure. Good question. I, I, I'm not sure what's the implication for estimating the sort of distribution. I mean, I, I need to figure out what is your, um, what's the error measure. But anyway, we can we can chat about that. I, I'm not sure about the answer to that question. All right. Other questions about this? Okay. Here's another amazing thing. Okay. If you thought that this theorem was interesting, um, it turns out that you don't have to get the exact profile maximum likelihood distribution. Okay. It suffices to get an approximate profile maximum likelihood distribution. So 
Suppose you know you weren't able to optimize this profile maximum likelihood objective. You were able to output some other distribution such that the objective function, which is the pro probability of seeing this profile, is not quite the highest, but within a factor of e to the n to the one minus delta is the highest. Okay, that's also good enough. It turns out for this. <coughs> So uh, basically an approximation factor of e to the n is, is trivial, or it's, it's pretty straightforward to get it. Maybe even the sequence maximum likelihood will give you that. But doing a little bit better than that will give you this too. Okay. All right. So here yeah, that's the open question. The open question is, can we get anything slightly better than e to the n for this problem? Mm -hmm. Just very quickly. Um, why does the approximation need to be so good? Because if you're assuming that f is ellipsoidal or something like that, then why does the approximation need to be? Yeah, it's like super polynomial. Right? Beta is almost exponential in n, right? It is. So what matters here is um, how many profiles there are. You're saying why is it the case that this kind of approximation is good enough for this application? Yeah, if you assume that f is literate, that seems like an overkill, but I mean, just like, just something that comes to mind now, like, why is so it? So we're not, no, no, we're not assuming that f is Lipschitz, okay. necessarily. There is a certain Lipschitz property which I haven't defined for the optimum estimator. Okay. So this is not something which is, this is not a theorem that um, applies to a, you can't look at a property and say, yes, this, this theorem applies to this. You have to design an estimator for that property that has this Lipschitz-like condition, and then you can verify if this theorem applies. So it's, it's a little more subtle. Okay. okay, all right. Okay, so the main result uh, is that we can actually get such an estimator. Okay. So we can get an estimator that has approximation e to the n to the two-thirds. That's the result. So what's the approximation between distributions? No, so the, the approximation is purely in the objective function, right? So the objective function was, what's the problem? Okay, so you're given a profile. You want to find a distribution that maximizes the probability of seeing the profile. Okay, so the probability of seeing the profile is the value of the objective function. We're going to get a, a different distribution, not the best one, but the, for this different distribution, the probability of seeing the profile will be no worse than a factor of e to the n to the two-thirds times the optimum, right? Yeah. Sorry, uh, can you just explain why that's the right scaling? So the likelihood can be 1 not e to the minus n, right? Like it has a fairly large range. Mm -hmm. So somehow you're saying no matter what the distribution is, that value of beta is good enough. And So you're going to give me a p that approximates the likelihood to that factor. Yes. Why is this somehow distribution independent? Right? Like in the sense, some distributions, like I mean, the likelihood is not scaled that nicely. I'm just trying to understand how this works. Uh, so you're saying that the um, the objective function, the probability itself, has a wide range. Yeah. Everything between one and e to the minus n. Something like that. Okay. So so why is it the case that this is is this possible or this is interesting? Uh, what, what was the question? Just like somehow, why shouldn't the beta depend on the scale of the likelihood for that problem? I mean, why should there be such a beta uh, independent of the dis distribution? That's awesome. Maybe the answer to that is is let's let's work through the yeah. the presentation and then maybe maybe you'll get the answer to that. Okay. It, so, okay, so one, one thing to check uh, is that you can get an e to the n approximation. Okay. So that sort of suggests that, yes, in principle, you can get something. It doesn't depend on your, you're not making any assumption of distribution, you can get e to the n, right? So that's an indication that something is possible. Now you're asking, you know, can you do better than e to the n? Sure. That's one way to think about it. Okay. What's, what's delta? I missed that. Delta? Yeah, where? Oh, I, I'm just saying that it just, it suffices to get a little improvement 
in this exponent. So you can get e to the minus n, e to the n, whatever. If you just could get n to the, instead of n to the power of 1, if you could get n to the power of 1 minus something, then you're done. That's all I'm saying. Okay? All right. Okay, so uh, let me just, uh, this is not the only way by which you can get universal estimators. There are a bunch of different approaches that have been su suggested in the literature. Uh, so profile maximum likelihood has been suggested. The one big open problem about was this, can you actually do this efficiently? So if you could do profile maximum likelihood, then you could do it. So we, this is the, exactly the problem that we address. Um, you know, other approaches, there's a linear programming based objective uh, ob uh, approach, which was, originally suggested by Efron and Thiestad, and then Valiant and Valiant developed this idea and, and used this to design estimators for uh, a couple of different properties. And there's another approach which is sort of a functional approximation approach, which has also been used. Um, there's a recent paper by, uh, uh, I think it's Han, Jiao, and, and Weissman that does a method called local moment matching. Um, that, that follows this particular approach, and again, they get universal estimators. This, this, is, this also applies to what's called the Gaussian setting, which these previous approaches don't apply to. Okay, so, so I just want to say that this is not the only way by which you could get universal estimators. There are other ways. I think this profile maximum likelihood is, a, is an interesting way to do it, and so we are motivated to work on the problem because we thought it's a, it's a cute and interesting question, which has some nice applications. Okay? All right. So, I won't say much about this slide, I just wanted to say that, look, you, there are different approaches that you could use to design estimators. And the big question with using these profile maximum likelihood approaches was that we didn't know how to do it efficiently, now we can. Okay. All right, so let me tell you a little bit, okay, so I spent a lot of time trying to motivate the problem, hopefully I've got you all fired up. Uh, and now I want to tell you how we actually do it, okay? So, um, I have 10 minutes, so let's see how far we can go. All right, so we, we already talked about two different problems, right? We talked about, we started with maximum likelihood, we talked about profile maximum likelihood. We're gonna define a, a bunch of other problems, okay? So bear with me. First, we're gonna define a discretized version. Then we're gonna define a slight variant of this discretized version. Then we're gonna take a convex relaxation of this objective, and that's gonna give us our algorithm. Okay, so I'll say a little bit about this sequence. Mostly I'll, fo I'll focus on this sequence of reformulations of the problem. So we're going to take our original problem, we're going to massage it in a few different ways so that it's, it's, it gets converted into something that we can actually solve. All right? Uh, we did some experiments, maybe I won't spend that much time on that, but, but if you're interested, I can show you some things. Okay, okay so how do we reformulate the problem? Um, uh, so, okay, so we have our distribution, we have a sequence of samples, we have a profile. We already defined the sequence probability. We also defined the profile probability. This is our objective function, okay? So this is the thing that we want to approximate. All right, so we're trying to solve this problem. We're trying to find the, the probability P that maximizes this objective function, okay? All right, and we're going to focus on approximation algorithms. Maybe I should have said this before. This is what we want, right? We want to find some other distribution such that its objective function is guaranteed to be beta times r optimal. Okay, that's what we want. All right, so a few different things. Um, we're going to try to impose some structure on our solution. Okay, so one simple thing to ask is, can we guarantee that the smallest probability in our distribution is not too small? Okay, and it turns out that we can do this. So you can always guarantee that uh, there is a, a solution that gives you a good value for the objective and has not too small probability. So the minimum probability that it has is at least 1 over 2n squared. So, so this we can do. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take our probability distribution and say, well, in general, the probability distribution would have a bunch of va values. Right? We saw examples where the values are half, one-fifth. Um, Let's look at all the d distinct values that it has. Okay. <coughs> We're going to try to ensure that it has only a small number of distinct values. Okay. So in fact, we're going to have to give up on the notion of strict probability distributions in the sense that our probabilities may no longer add up to exactly one. It'll be less than equal to one. That's fine. 
you could still plug into our objective function and you know we can sort of evaluate it. And we can always scale them up and produce a real probability distribution. Okay. All right. So now I'm gonna I'm gonna stipulate that all of my probability values are gonna lie in a small set. Okay, and my set is gonna be of the following form. We're gonna take multiples of one plus epsilon one. So we're gonna take powers of one plus epsilon one. Okay, so we're gonna take B1 such powers of one plus epsilon one. B1, by the way, is something like log n over epsilon one. All right. Because I said all my probabilities range from <coughs> one over two n squared to one, and they go up in multiples of one plus epsilon one. Okay, so how much do we lose in trying to massage our probability, probability distribution so that all of its values lie in this set? Not too much. It turns out that we can guarantee that you can produce such a massaged distribution and the value of the objective function changes by at most e to the epsilon 1n. Okay. This is entirely believable. We can do this. All right. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to say that we can look at the profile itself. This is the frequencies by which we see the elements. And we can massage those too. Okay. So again, these profile, the values, the frequencies of the elements that we see could be arbitrary integers, right? Um, it'd be nice if they, 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 uh, they took on only a small set of values. So again, we're gonna, do, we're gonna say, let's, let's allow them to only take on values of the form one plus, one plus epsilon two, epsilon two by two here, powers of one plus epsilon two by two. Um, okay, so we're going to restrict our profile to only take values in the set. And again, the, the number of such values are about log n over epsilon 2. So we're going to take our profile, the real profile, we're going to discretize it in the sense of rounding up all the frequencies to the next power of 1 plus epsilon 2 by 2 that lies in the set. Right. Now again, this modifies the objective function a little bit, but not too much you can show that the change in the objective function is at most e to the power of epsilon 2 n log n. Okay. So we do two things. We discretize the probabilities. We discretize the profile. All right. Okay. So now we're ready to talk about our first new problem. So we had profile maximum likelihood. The discrete profile maximum likelihood problem says Find me a distribution, not arbitrary distribution, but a discrete pseudo distribution. One whose probability values can only take values from this structured set that I had, that maximize the probability of not the actual profile, but the discretized version of the profile. Okay, so we're gonna ask, can we find discretized probability distribution that maximizes the probability of the discretized profile? And we just argued, or I just claimed, that this new problem has objective function, which is not too bad compared to the original problem. This is exactly the loss moving from one to the other. Okay? So as long as I control my epsilon one and epsilon two, I'll be fine. Okay, so now, you know, the whole point of doing this um, discretization was to say that you know, remember I said that uh, when you want to compute the probability of seeing a particular profile for a given probability distribution, it corresponds to having you know, this, this permanent. And this permanent is a little unwieldy. Okay. Uh, so what we're going to do is, because we have this nice uh, grouping of probabilities and, and uh, frequencies, we're going to try to say that a lot of the terms that arise in this permanent can be clubbed together. So how exactly can they be clubbed together? So one way to think about how exactly they can be clubbed together is to say that if you want to figure out you know, what's the probability of seeing this particular profile, what you have to do is the following. So on the bottom, you have elements of different probabilities. Right? This is your underlying distribution. And then you have your frequencies. This is what you actually observe in your profile. In computing the probability of seeing this particular profile, you're going to have to say, well, let's say we had some number of elements from here appear so many times, 
some number of elements from here appear so many times, some number of elements from here appear so many times, and so on and so forth. You've got to specify, in some sense, the edges of this bipartite graph. How many elements fall from this set of probabilities were observed so many times in your sequence, right? So this pattern, this, this, bi uh, this bipartite graph, the values of these edges, I'm going to refer to that as a type. Okay. Now, within a particular type, which is once I specify how many elements fall from here to here, there's still many, many choices. Right? You still have to figure out which elements of this set precisely went here, which elements of this set went here, and so on and so forth. There's still a lot of terms in here, right? But they're all grouped very nicely so that the probability term for all of them is exactly the same. Right? That's the whole point. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at our, our uh, probabilities here, our frequencies, and we're going to look at this bipartite graph. Okay? We're going to look at all possible values that we could put on this bipartite graph. Okay? And the way, which we, the way which we put values in the bipartite graph, well, we know that we have a certain number of elements that need to, be, need to appear some number of times. Obviously, the, if you look at the sum of the edges of this bipartite graph, okay, this is at most this. Okay? There's also a probability constraint. Okay? What's the probability constraint? Well, one way to write the probability constraint is to say that if I sum up the probabilities of all the elements, I should get at most one. Okay? And that's what this constraint is. Okay? Um, Another way to write the probability constraint would be, I actually have numbers at the bottom, which tell me how many elements of each probability class there are. And then I just say, well, I have the cardinality constraint. The sum of the edges, sum up to atmosphere. Okay, all right. Couple of minutes, sir. About two minutes. Okay, good. So what's the key point? The key point is that my objective function can be written as a sum over <coughs> all of these types, okay. where each type includes, so, so, okay, so there is a, there's a combinatorial term here which depends only on the profile and nothing else. Okay. And then I'm going to sum over types. Right? Each type includes a probability term, which is fixed for that type, and then a combinatorial term. Right? So you've aggregated a whole bunch of terms. Okay. So now what we're going to say is, we're going to simplify this. We're going to say, forget about trying to sum up over all types. Let's just find the one type that gives us the maximum contribution. Right? Let's try to find the one type that gives us maximum contribution. And that's going to be our new version, uh, our, our next uh, optimization problem. Right? How much did we lose in doing this? Well, in general, there are many types. Our objective function is getting contribution from all of these. Okay. Now we just said, let's focus on one. How much do we lose? Well, exactly the number of types. Right? So how many different bipartite graphs can you have matching the top to the bottom? Okay. Well, we had B1 terms here, B2 terms here. Each of these, there are B1, B2 numbers. Right? And each of them can take values, let's say, 1 through n. That's a generous upper bound. So the number of numbers that we have is, number of such types is n to the power of b1, b2. Okay, and b1, if you remember, was log n over epsilon 1. b2 was log n over epsilon 2. So this number is e to the power of log cubed n divided by epsilon 1, epsilon 2. Okay, so eventually, in translating this objective from our original to this new one, we lost this term, this term, and this term. Okay? And now we try to balance these by setting epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 to be roughly n to the minus 1 third. Okay. That gives us our e to the n to the 2 thirds. Okay? What I didn't tell you is how you handle this one. Now that you've, you've made this objective presumably tractable, you still need to solve it. Uh, <clears throat> so the way in which we solve it is we realize that, in fact, we can convexify this objective. Okay? So, Instead of trying to find a bipartite graph where all of these things are integers, we allow them to be real valued. You can solve this. There are still some things to address, which is how do you take this fractional solution and map it to a real integer solution? Turns out this can be done. 
uh, and you can design it out of it. Okay? All right, so I'm not, I'm really out of time, so I'm not going to say anything about this. Um, one thing I should say is that, in fact, you can get this whole scheme to run in near linear time. So you can run this in near linear time in the size of your profile. All right. Uh, all right, we did some experiments. It sounds like uh, this is a complicated algorithm. In fact, you can implement it. It seems to work really well. We should have a paper on this up in the archive in a few days. So if you want to see more details, uh, I would recommend you go look at the paper. Thank you. Questions? Do you expect the problem to be easier than this if uh, the, uh, the original distribution over types is some kind of generic, or has some kind of generic, genericity assumptions? So your result is worst case, right? So yes, our result is worst case. Any distribution, you can get the square mm -hmm. Um If I remove the worst case assumption and I put a average case assumption, do you expect the problem to be easier or to, would it still be hard? You're, you're restricting, you're making some assumption about uh, the, the set of distributions that you might draw this from. I mean, presumably it's simpler, but I, I don't know how to exploit this. I don't know how to exploit the, the additional thing. Yeah. It, I guess it depends on the, you know, how exactly you choose to make it. Yeah. So, I don't know. Yeah. Answer. Uh, uh, maybe I missed something, but somehow by assuming the probabilities are lower bounded, you're assuming a, a sort of boundedness of the support. Yes. Right? Yes. Um, so if the support is bounded, say, by n squared, then the support size in itself is... Can never be bigger than n squared. So that's some sort of implicit thing that comes out of... The point is that our goal was to approximate the profile maximum likelihood, yeah. right? So if you have a profile of size n, we're saying that if you restrict yourself to distributions over a support size of n square, 2 n square, um, you're within a constant factor of this objective one. That's what we're saying. I understand. But somehow you're going to plug this into now a, an right. estimator of... Yes. Of so, so the point is for support size, it turns out, if you're interested in support size, you know that you need n over log n samples. So if capital N is a support size, you need to have capital N over log n. So this means that... This estimator is going to be meaningless if you apply it to support sizes that are smaller, right? You'll never get that, right? So for that, you have to appeal on, appeal to the known results on support size to figure out what's the sample size. Sorry, you had a question. Yeah. So do we know, so what do we need to know about the optimal uh, profile uh, maximum likelihoodness? Or do we even know, for example, that it can be described with polynomial number of bits? Oh, what do we know about the, the actual distribution the, that maximizes the profile? Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you're not talking about the algorithmic question. You're saying, what, what do we know about the distribution that maximizes this? Okay. Uh, so we know a bunch of things, and this is, uh, again, work of Alon Orlitsky and his group over a few, few different papers. Um, one thing we know is that, you know, in general, there are a bunch of probabilities, and there might be a continuous part in the end. So it could be a, a portion of the distribution that's smeared over many, inf infinitely many elements, so all with infinitesimal probability. Right? So the distribution is always of this form. So it has a bunch of discrete values, and it may optionally have something that's smeared over. Okay. Um, these these values, people have figured out that they, they satisfy a bunch of algebraic equations, and in fact, they've They've actually used the, this characterization to figure out what are these distributions for all profiles of size seven, say up to seven. So yeah, we know a bunch of different properties, but uh, so do do we know that they can be described with polynomial number of bits? Um, I'm not sure. I I I think so, but I haven't looked very carefully. So I know that they. They sort of characterize these as solutions to some algebraic equations. I don't know if these are if and only if characterizations, first of all, and if this implies that there are polynomial size solutions. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think so, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay.